questions about the floor before about the class in general? Okay, so we have practically going to finish chapter one today and start chapter two. So basically chapter one, what we have left is just do a couple of problems and that's about it. So from chapter one, what was important in here, it was uh, the equations of motion. So we had mass conservation, or sometimes it's called continuity. Then we have momentum. Here with momentum, we have three equations. We can talk about the x, y, and z directions. Then we also talk about the energy equation. And then in here we have some thermodynamics. So we talk a little bit. We had an um, ideal gas, so ideal gas flow. And we also have an enthalpy and entropy. And from entropy, and from entropy, which was the S, is where we came to isentropic. And isentropic flow, basically, then we had the isentropic flow equations. And these are the equations that you're going to see a lot when, um, when doing this uh, compressible flow. So basically, all this was just derived from compressible flow where the density was not a constant anymore. <laughs> any questions about any of those equations or, or anything about those? Okay, so now that we have, and we know those equations are the ones that we can use, uh, let's do a couple of examples. So first I'm gonna do example 1.7 in your textbook, and then I'm gonna do uh, one from the one problems from the problems in your book. So this problem, particularly what we have, we have a nozzle. And in this nozzle, we have this convergent diverging nozzle. And we have hydrogen in here. We're also going to assume where we're going to take the control system to be just the boundaries of the nozzle. And we take anything that is inside. That will be a control system so we can have that control volume in there. We want to have inlet conditions. As far as the inlet conditions go, we have, we're going to call that one location and the outlet two. So the inlet conditions, we have 500 kilopascals. We also have the temperature of one is going to be 500 Kelvin. And the other thing that we're going to do is, we're going to have uh, a very big assumption that you're going to make a lot in this course when it comes to nozzle sensing is that normally the fluid comes at a, at a relatively slow speed and then it gets speed up at the end. So because of that, imagine this comes from a reservoir somewhere that is stationary, we're gonna assume that that velocity at the inlet is very, really, very small. So we're gonna assume that this is practically zero. And that's a really big assumption that we're gonna be making a lot, or you're gonna be making a lot in this course. And the outlet, we're gonna have pressure two, hundred kilopascals. And the other thing that we're going to have here, we're going to have that the area at the outlet is going to be 500 centimeters square. Now this is good. this is an example, a good example of how we have thermal energy. So basically, we have very high temperature. Now that high temperature is the one that is going to uh, generate the heat. So we have thermal energy becoming mechanical energy or kinetic energy. So we have that high temperature becomes some kind of high velocity at the end. So we're just speeding up the fluid. And that, this happens because of that change in pressure. So we have a change in pressure, the fluid is going to want to go in that direction and then lower, lower pressure in there. So what we want to find is, we want to find velocity too, so the velocity at the exit, and also just the mass flow rate that goes through the, through the flow. Now, first we have to make our assumptions. So one thing that we're going to do first, we're going to assume that it's isotropic. And by doing that, we're just saying that it's idiobatic. So basically, there is no heat loss. This term is equal to zero. And it's also reversible. And the next assumptions that we're going to make are the ones that are going to help us solve the equation. So we're going to assume steady. We have hydrogen 
So by having hydrogen, we're going to assume that it's a perfect gas. So that is H2. And because we have hydrogen, this particular uh, gas has some parameters that we can use. And that will be our CP, that is 14.5 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And the other parameter that we're going to get from here is our gas constant. And for hydrogen, it's 4.124 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, we're talking about hydrogen. So because of that, we're going to use these parameters to find gamma. So this is not going to be equal to 1.4 like it is for gas for air. It's going to be very close to 1.4, but we cannot make that assumption because if we do that assumption, then we're going to be tempted to use the tables in the back of the book to solve for this. So we don't want to do that. So just keep that in mind for future reference. So the first thing that we're going to do is a set of equations that we want to solve. Now we're talking here about temperatures and talking about energy. So we're going to use the energy equation. So the first thing that we do is write our energy equation and then simplify it with the assumptions that we have. So we have Q minus W. Remember, this one doesn't have the flow fluid working there. It doesn't have the apostrophe. Then we have the unsteady term plus, so here we have the term, plus whatever crosses the control surface. Now, this is going to go to zero. Let's go ahead and write it down. So we know that because that's steady. Also, we have isentropic, which means adiabatic. So there is no heat. And there is no mechanical work. There is no like a turbine or a paddle or anything like that. So that also goes to zero. So there is no work or heat transfer. <coughs> that's why those two go away. So the only thing that we have left is this way now. When it comes to kinetic energy, we cannot get rid of that. As we know, that's really what we're looking for. Uh, potential energy, as we see from our control volume, everything is basically the same height. So we can assume that C1 equals C2. So this can go to zero. And then that's what we, we have left in here. Now remember, in here, in this H, here is where we have the pressure. So the pressure hasn't gone anywhere, it's just in the enthalpy. And that comes to the remember the work has to do with um, the mechanical work plus all that work for pressure. And that is in our entropy, which is here for C. So that's where the pressure is. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now the next thing that we're going to do is for their assumptions, we have the integral, so how do we deal with them? We're going to assume uniform flow. And we can do that assumption because we're just going to assume this viscous flow still all the velocity or the fluid just goes in and out in a uniform matter. So we don't have to worry about any, any integrals of it. So by uniform flow, we can uh, simplify that. So as we see, we only have one term in here. And remember, inlets are negative and outlets are positive. And this comes from this term in here. Because this term in there is our mass flow rate. Uh, let's do the outlets by the inlets. So we're going to do this term in here. So 2 minus 1, so h2 plus v2 squared over 2 has mass flow rate at 2 minus, and then the inlet, 1 plus v1 squared over 2 m1 equals 0. So basically, it's just because we only have one term in our equation, this is how we solve it, and this is much easier to solve now. Now, we already said that. Uh, velocity at 1 is going to be equal to 0, so this term goes away, and that is just because that velocity at 1 is not very <coughs> zero, but it's very close to 0, or very small, that we can make like the full pair to be 2. The other thing is, what about the mass? So to the mass flow rate, whatever comes in has to come out, so we can assume that mass flow rate in equals the mass flow rate out, which then equals that constant. And this comes from conservation of mass. So there's only one inlet and only one outlet, so everything has to be the same. And because it's a steady problem, there is no mass changes inside. So because of that, we can divide by m, and also this two go away. So we only have these parameters in here. So if we solve that, or we simplify that, we get that h2 plus v2 squared over 2 equals h1. 
Now, we want to solve for V2, that's what the problem is looking for. So V2 equals square root of 2, H1 minus H2. Now, we don't really have the enthalpies, but we know from the thermodynamic equations, if we keep like specific uh, heat constants and an ideal gas, so we have ideal gas, and because of that, we're also assuming constant Cp. We can use the definition of enthalpy to simplify this and put it in terms of temperature. And that would be equal to uh, 2 Cp P1 minus And this is just from the definition of H in terms of C and C. So what do we have here? We have the Cp is given to us in the problem. They give us the inlet temperature but we don't have P2. So the next thing on this, on this problem is to actually find the temperature allocation too. So to find P2, how do we do that? Now we already, we know that we have the three equations, mass, momentum, and energy, but we never really talk about temperature in there. The equation that has temperature in it was when we talk about the isentropic relation. So if we have our isentropic relations, we can find P2. And that they give us the, the pressures and they give us more temperature. So we have everything to find what we need. So P2 over P1 equals P2 over P1 gamma minus 1 over gamma. So this is from isentropic relationships. So we have through the parameters, we can find the force. Now remember I said gamma is not equal to 1.4 because it's not air, it's hydrogen. So we have to solve that from the parameters they give us in the problem. So remember gamma is equal to Cp over Cb. They give us Cp and R, so we can just rewrite this as Cp, Cp minus R. We have all those values in there. So this is 1.397. So as you see, this is very close to 1.4. So most likely if you were to do this problem when it came 1.4, you're gonna have a solution that is very close to what you need. But you have to be careful as um, when Dr. Chen solves this, when he sees that 1.4 assumption, he might actually mark the problem more because <coughs> you, he wants you to be able to find the right solution in this. So don't assume a value that is known when you have the parameters to solve for it. So once we have that and we have our R, we can just plug in the values and just get what the uh, temperature is. So just plug it in. So P2 over T1 equals, so P2 was 500. And P1 is 100. Now this is given in kilopascals as well as what is in my kilopascals, the units will cancel. So we don't have to do anything there. And we do here 1.397 minus 1. 1.397. So the ratio is 0 0.6329. And then the answer will be P2 equals P1 times this parameter. So P2 equals to 316.145 Kelvin. Now remember, at the beginning of the problem, P1 was equal to 500 kilopascals. So this change in temperature, this decrease in temperature, it actually went into what the velocity is. So that's how we have the thermal energy and the common kinetic energy. So now what the problem is looking for, we want to find the velocity. So now that we have everything, we should be able to find the velocity from this equation here. So we just need to plug in and we should get the solution. So we have V2 equals 2 times Cp, 14.5, times P1 minus P2. And this is equal to 2307 meters per second. Now, uh, we want to see if this is, this is uh, we're assuming this is compressible flow, so let's see if that's the case by just finding what the Mach number is. Remember, anything greater than 0 0.3, we're assuming that we're uh, using compressible flow and the density is not constant. So in order to do that, we haven't really derived these equations, so I'm just going to do it here as a side note. I'm going to get to them in chapter 2, I mean, later in chapter 3 with Dr. Chen. So the equation for the Mach number is the velocity over the speed of light. And we're actually going to derive the speed of light later today or on Thursday. So that is gamma over P. So this is just from the definition. We haven't really looked into them. But if we do that, then we get that the Mach number is 1.709. So clearly it's higher than 0.3 and it's supersonic. So we are talking about 
from principles going here. So our assumptions are right. The new thing that we want to check, we want to check if it's isentropic as we say. So we can use the isentropic flow. Now this is gonna hold true as we use isentropic flow equations, but let's just use the uh, definition of isentropic flow. There's two minus this one is that Cp ln T2 over T1 minus R ln T2 over T1. Now we want to make sure that this is equal to zero. And if it's equal to zero, then we know we are doing the right assumptions and we did the right the column right. So it's kind of like a sentence right here. So we have 14.5 ln of 316 of 45 over 500 minus 4.124 ln of 500 over 500. And if we do this, we get negative 6.633 minus minus 6.637. So as we see, it's very close, but it's practically zero. So remember this kills you, this kilogram kills it. So this is isentropic and the assumption is, is good, the assumptions we made. Now, always go back and see what the problem is asking. The problem is asking for velocity, the problem is also asking for what the mass flow rate is. So we cannot forget to find that. And that's just gonna be very simple by definition. Mass flow rate equals rho V A. And remember this is equal to rho one V A one, or rho two V two A two. Now, this problem didn't give us A one, so we're gonna to have to use this for the problem, okay? Question? Yes, uh, is, is it perfectly isentropic with the assumption of the velocity at the beginning of the problem? Uh, it is, but this is just like numerics where it's like rounding up throughout the problem and stuff. So when we're just putting a computer, it's not like that doing the process to zero. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Um, in the very beginning of the problem, you stated that uh, P2 was uh, 200. I mean, yeah, P2, oh, I, I wrote it wrong. I think I'm worried about it. I didn't question okay? If we're assuming the inlet velocity is zero, mm -hmm. do we have to assume the inlet area is approximately infinity? Uh, in theory, if you were to put it that way for mathematical purposes, but that's why we're assuming it's close to zero. It's really gonna be point zero point zero 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 someplace. So the assumption, like a better way to say assumption is for something that you want is much more smaller than P2. And by doing that, we can assume that it's so small that it's zero. Any other questions? Okay. So we actually don't have that A1 here. It's not given to us in the problem. So to find the mass flow rate, we can use the, um, the parameters at the axis. And we already found that V2 in here. So let's, let's do that in there and find the mass flow rate of the problem. Now, mass flow rate is going to be the rho. Uh, the density, to find the density, we use the um, perfect gas flow. So that is P2, R, P2. We already have all those parameters, so we can do this. So we have V2 and A2. So now let's do it. Make sure that we have everything in the right um, units. So we're gonna use the kilojoules, so we have to make, this, uh, make sure that the R is also in the same units, and it's given to us this problem in the same unit, so we don't have to convert here. So make sure you always pay attention to that. Uh, trick that Dr. Chen likes to use is to mix around the units, so make sure that you always have the right units. Then 2307, this is our velocity. And for our area, it's given to us in the problem in centimeters squared, so we have to make sure we put that in meters squared, so we don't make a mistake here. So 500 times 10 to the negative 4. So we can have that in units. And if we do that, we get 8.8388 kilograms per second. So always make sure that when you write your answers, you should be this at Any questions? Okay, so this is, what, this is the kinds of problems that you might see as they involve most of the things that you saw in the chapter. I'm gonna do another example in here. Uh, this is problem 1.14 from uh, the problem at the back of your book. It's not one of your homework problems, but it will just help you get to know how uh, the procedure to take any kind of problem. Now this problem is uh, 1.14. It's a turbine. So you have a turbine. So the turbines here make some kind of work. And we have an inlet. We call the inlet 
one. And we have a Allen, so we call that Allen good. And this is gonna work on air, so it's an air turbine. Now uh, we're gonna have that the mass flow rate is equal to 0 0.25 kilograms per second. So whatever comes in comes out and then it just generates some kind of work in it. Uh, the parameter at one, P1, equals once again 100 kilopascal. And P1 equals 20 degrees centigrade, which we want this in Kelvin, so 293 Kelvin. The other thing that we have, we have that P2 is 800 kilopascal. So as we see, the pressure is increasing. Our temperature too, then it's going to be increasing 50 degrees Celsius. Kelvin. The other thing that we have, we have some kind of area going on in here, and we're going to assume the areas, the inlet and the outlet, are the same. So D1 equals D2. So this is the diameter equals 4 centimeters or 0 0.04. Now uh, we want to need some thermodynamic properties in here for air. So we have that our CP equals 1.005 per kilogram. Kelvin and at R or gas constant for air would be 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So as we notice here, it's important when you set up your your um, your problem, it's always good to just put all the way that you make it. So when it you start plugging in, you just don't get the wrong number in there. So what would you want to do? We want to find what's the velocity at two, so what velocity is coming here and also the work. So let's do that. Uh, first, we're gonna do our assumptions. So the first thing that you do always is to state your assumption. So we're gonna assume the state of it. And by assuming that, we're assuming there is no heat loss to the environment, uh, steady. So we have steady flow going in there. We're also gonna assume that it's perfect gas Whenever you have added problem, you actually have the words of the problem. A lot of these assumptions are going to be implied in the problem, so make sure to look for them in your question what you're looking for. Uh, then we have uniform property. So that way our integrals become easier. Another thing that we can do uh, right away using a conservation of mass, so for mass conservation, have that the mass flow rate at one equals the mass flow rate at two, which equals the mass flow rate in general. And why do we do that? Because we're looking for V2, and we might have everything that we need already. And they give us both the pressure and temperature, pressure and temperature. So we have a lot of the parameters that we need. So we might be able to solve right away without having to use any of the other equations in here. And that is for the velocity. <coughs> so also, uh, let's find, so mass flow rate equals rho one, V1, A1 equals rho 2, V2, A2. Now they don't give us the velocities, but they give us uh, the area, which are the same. And they also give us uh, the T and P, the temperature and pressure for location, so we can find the load. So we can find that, we can find everything else that we need. They also give us the mass flow rate in here. So we basically have two equations, two unknowns, which is the velocity. So let's first just find the areas. Area one equals area two, so that is uh, one mm -hmm. squared. Make sure that you put the diameter in meters, so we need, and that is 0 0.001257 meters squared. And now uh, to find the rho for the density, we're gonna use our gas flow. So rho one equals P1 R P1. That is 100 times 0 0.287, 293. So make sure here that the gas constant and the pressure units match so they cancel out the right way. And we get 1.189 kilograms per meter cube. So let's say the units for density, for the density entering, and then for the density exiting, that will be equal to 800, 0 0.287, and that would be 323 Kelvin. So it's 8.63 kilograms per meter cube. So as we saw, our density increased. Now, 
now let's do the velocity. So for velocity one. And why am I solving for everything? Because we might need that later on to find the, the word, even though the column only looks for velocity two. Let's just find velocity one. So we can use that by using this part of the equation, given that the mass squared is given to us. So if we rearrange this equation, forget that the mass squared rate is 0 0.25. This is given to us, so we didn't have to find it. Divided by the density, 1.139, times the area, 0 0.00025. So the velocity of 1 is 167.3 meters per second. And the velocity of 2, which is what we're looking for, exactly the same way. E2 equals 0 0.25. The density at 0.2 is 8.63. And once again, we have the same area, 0 0.00057. And this velocity is going to slow down to 23.1 meters per second. That's the speed. So now we have V2. Now the other thing that we're looking for in this problem is the word. And where do we see this word? We see this word in our um, energy equation. So once again, we're going to write the energy equation to our appropriate assumptions, and from this assumption, uh, we're going to take over. So let's write out Q minus W equals our steady term. We're not going to write that because it's, it's already on set, a steady, so we know that can go away. Plus H plus V squared over 2 plus Q V rho V. Okay, so we said it's adiabatic, so that goes to zero. We have that steady, so that goes to zero. So this is steady, this is adiabatic. Now, the word is not going to go away this time, because that's actually what we're solving for. Now, when it comes to, remember this over here, it's a mass flow rate. Our kinetic energy, we already know that the velocity of one and two are actually quite different, so we can get rid of that. And it's up here, it's those pressure changes, and we we'll to talk about the potential energy. Most of this problem, Especially when it comes to the air, we can assume this is relatively small. But the difference is not much, not, not very big between Z1 and Z1, Z2. So we can assume that potential energy is here. Or really, we're just like, like the potential energy. Or any changes in potential energy compared to anything else in the problem. Because in this problem, what is big is going to be that kinetic energy because of that changes in, in velocity. Any questions? It seems kind of odd to assume the turbine is adiabatic. Uh, it is. So it's going to be some kind of heat loss. But in the problem itself, if you read it, it just says it's insulated, stuff like that. So we're assuming. Now, we're basically to make it simpler. Most of the time, sometimes it tells you heat is coming in at a certain rate. So just put here. As long as you still have the same unit, just plug in a no extra number in there. We're just here assuming that it's an ideal turbine in which there is no heat loss of any kind. Any other questions? Okay, so now that we have that, let's uh, write this equation. Remember, we're also assuming we have a uniform property, so the integral will become easier. So we have a negative work equals. So we have the whatever comes in, what, whatever comes out minus what comes in. So we can just take the mass rate, we already know the constant, so we can just take it out. And then we have the out minus in of h and then the out minus n of two. So here is just this equation is just rearranged. This way you can uh, be writing like I could be writing it. However you see it it's easier. It's just rearranged it so we can uh, clump together the parameters that go together. And that's just basically because we already know from um, constant property what this becomes in terms of temperature. So we could write that we get the mass flow rate Cp C2 minus C1, and here is just uh, V squared minus C squared over 2. So we are given C2, we also have the temperature 2 and temperature 1. We calculated V2 and V1 early in the problem, and we have the mass flow rate. So basically we have everything to find that work in here. So our work will be at 0 0.25. 1.005, 323 minus 293 plus 22.1 squared 
minus 157.3 squared divided by 2. So it's just plug in numbers. And this is 4.1 kilojoules per second. So our work will be equal to negative 4.1.
remember from previous courses, stream length is just what really what the path of a particle is. So how a particle will move. Uh, now for incompressible, so for previous courses, uh, incompressible flow, remember that Mach number is always going to be less than 0 0.3. So there is no shock waves, no speed of sound, nothing like that. So we can have two kinds of flows for incompressible flow. We have in viscous, and we also have viscous. Now remember viscous, is if we have some kind of friction or anything like that. So we have, let's imagine we have a body. And for in viscous flow, if we draw the uh, streamline, Streamlines would just go, see the body, go turn around, and keep on going. That is how it moves. And it just go around. So if you miss it, well, it would just go streamlines, they're just going to bend according to the body moving. Now for viscous flow, we have the same body. But what's going to happen is because there is a friction on the surface, the flow is going to go and then it's going to get some kind of friction, and then we're going to have what is called the flow separation. So we're going to have. Separation. So the streamlines become more turbulent as we go along. This is flow separation. And this contributes to the, to the sense of forces. So you have more drag and things of that sort. You see that a lot um, with airfoil. So you have the handle that passes high enough, you have a lot of separation, and then we have where the airfoil is going to stop. And this is basically in viscous flow, as we see all perfect and um, steady and laminar. It's basically what we just know as ideal flow and makes everything so much easier. Now, how do we know that, uh, how does the flow know how to do this? How to just not crash against the body? And that's why we have that this concept of wave propagation. So basically what happens is that this body <coughs> can send some signals to the flow in front of it. And by sending signals, the flow knows beforehand what's coming afterwards. So by doing that, the flow can just turn around without crashing into the body. So we're just gonna rewrite that and just have a signal wave sent from body. So the body itself is always kind of radiating information to whatever is in front of it. So the signal waves sent from body, they're gonna be faster than the flow. If they were slower than the flow, then the, the flow will just crash against the body. So the signal waves sent from body are faster than the actual velocity of the moving fluid. And this is, remember, this is incompressible. So here we're talking about mass, a mass number of less than zero point two. So it's low flow. So because of that, doing that, then as I was saying, the flow adjusts to the body before Now what would happen if this were in the case, if this was in the case, the fluid wouldn't know that that's there, and then that's when we have abrupt changes. So otherwise, the fluid does not know the body is there, the body is there beforehand. So if it doesn't know it's there beforehand, then we have our abrupt changes. Changes happen in the um, change velocity properties. So the, in order for the flow to like adjust to this new flow going on in there, it has to do something. And this is what is called our shock wave. So the flow, the fluid has to do something. It's coming way too fast to be able to turn around because it didn't get the signals fast enough. And because of that, it causes a shock wave. And basically, the shock wave it does it dramatically decreases the speed, and therefore, it doesn't crash against the body itself. So how fast does this <coughs> signal waves travel? And this is really why it's called the speed of sound, because signal waves travel at the velocity of sound. So if you go any faster than the velocity of, one, of sound, which is Mach equals one, then you're in the this problem in which we have shock waves. So now let's uh, talk a little bit about the velocity of sound. And how can we derive that equation? So the velocity of sound can travel in all kinds of um, fluids. It can travel in fluids, solids, liquids, gases. Uh, but most of the stuff that we're going to deal with in this class, being an aerodynamics class, is going to be on gases. 
So this is 2.3 velocity of sound. So let's derive this equation. Let's, uh, in order to derive this equation, let's, uh, let's set up a case. So we have, let's imagine a piston. With a piston. <coughs> so this piston can either expand or contract this one. <coughs> And before that, the gas here is at rest. So we have stationary, stationary gas. Nothing is moving. So we have stationary gas are properties of rho, T, T for a temperature, uh, pressure, and density. And because being is at rest, we have that the velocity will be equal to zero. So that's it as far as it happens. Now we're going to get the, um, the piston and we're going to actually compress this. So we're going to squish the gas. So we're going to rewrite that. Here, so we have the piston. Now the piston, we're going to move it to the right. It's going to move in this direction. So move piston to right with velocity. So we're moving the piston very little. It's not much, but it's just a small distance enough that we can and modify the same way in front of it. So by doing that, there's the flow right in front of the piston is going to change properties. So we're going to have BCP, so our pressure is going to change, our rho is going to change by alpha plus one quantity, our temperature is going to change by some quantity, and their velocity is going to go from zero to the velocity of the piston. So our velocity and your velocity is PV. Now, this is going to generate, uh, these properties are going to be uh, shown to the rest of the fluid by a certain speed, and that's going to be by moving at a velocity a. So this, this properties are going to be translated to the rest of the fluid at a velocity a. So at, before the velocity a, we still have gas at rest. So downstream, the gas is still at rest before it reaches this parameter. So we still have v equals zero, rho, t, c. So what is this? This here, or this signal, signal device, is going to be a moving rate. And it's going to be the way that it's going to be kind of informing what's coming next. And this is also what is called the sound wave. So it's moving wave, sound wave, or sometimes it's called acoustic wave. So we have all these different names for it. This speed of sound is also sometimes an acoustic, acoustic sound. And now this moving wave, because it's being moved to this right, is also called, in this case, it's going to be compression. Because if we wanted to, we could do the same thing, but instead of pushing the piston, we could be pulling it. So there will be also uh, changes, but that will be an expansion. So there will be an expansion moving away. This time it's a compression moving away. So really what is this A? So this A is a speed of sound. And in order to derive it, let's do a functional volume approach into this area here to see how the parameters change from our location to the next. So what is A? And that A, as you see, is by definition, it's a speed of sound or the acoustic speed. <coughs> and just keep in mind that it's called these two things. Uh, Dr. Chen likes to ask in test what is the acoustic speed of something. Just make sure that you do remember that it's the same thing, speed of sound and acoustic speed. So how do, how do we derive A? We're going to derive it using a control volume approach. So the control volume approach that we learned in chapter one, we're going to do it in here. So the first thing that we do, we're going to set our control volume and our control pressure so we can know what goes in and what goes out of the control pressure. So, so we have the cylinder of the tube, we have our, this here is going to be our weight. Now, about this problem in particular, so we can make this move here. This wave here is moving. To solve a moving wave, it means that we have to do an unsteady problem. So in order to make this a problem that is a steady problem, so we want to somehow modify our um, coordinate system so we can treat this as a steady problem. We're going to uh, set up our coordinate system right on top of the wave. So we're moving with the wave. But by doing that, we're also going to assume that the x is on the left-hand side. And this is just for a convention of positives and negatives and stuff like that. You can also derive this with the x going to the right-hand side. It doesn't matter. But it's easier the derivation to <coughs> give the x to the left-hand side. So the positive is to the left, and the negative is to the right. -hand. So it's different from what we used to. Now, by doing this, we have a steady. Basically, what we're doing here, we're doing is LLN 
reference frame. <coughs> so basically, we're saying we're just moving with what we are the couple was moving. So if we're standing on top of the wave, everything else to us, the wave is stationary and everything else is moving. So basically, and by doing this, also we're moving with constant velocity. So we have constant velocity. We're not really accelerating. So we can treat this as spinning. And by doing that, we're going to first apply a control surface. So we're going to put the control surface right around the wave. So the control surface is moving with us. So control surface, or the control volume, is moving also at sound speed. And that makes this, the system easier, as we can uh, solve this steady and we don't have to worry about the derivation. Now, if we do that, what happens? If this is moving stationary at, at a particular, make it stationary, we already know that this is moving at a velocity A, so we are gonna have to subtract, subtract negative A everywhere. And by doing that, we can just take into consideration that A is here. So basically, the problem, this is for moving, if we were to do this problem for stationary, so this is not moving, we're assuming this is steady, and we have the moving wave. So this is the moving wave, this is moving at a velocity A, and we have that the velocity here is moving at DC. So this will be the problem that we have if we make it into this kind of notation, what we're gonna have in here now is that whatever is coming in here is gonna be that A, all those steady properties, well, and whatever is coming out, we have to subtract A to it. So we have A minus CB T plus P zero plus zero. So, so basically, we're taking this over here. This parameter go the same. Whatever goes in here goes in the right. But what we're going to have to add now is that velocity. So remember, that velocity was zero. So we subtract A. It becomes A. Remember, we're using the positive to the left hand side. That's why it becomes all positive. And the same way here, we we'll subtract that in there. So that the velocity is A minus that little velocity in there. So we're just doing um, coordinate con conversion in here. So we can go from stationary to moving. So if we do that, we already know that it's steady. So D, DT goes to zero. So because of that, we can write our continuity and mass momentum in here. So our continuity becomes um, the A is equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about the steady term, unsteady term, and X momentum. We don't want to worry about Y or Z. It's only in one direction of the X. So we have the summation of the forces, so whatever crosses the control surface, the X rho V. <coughs> and these are the equation solution for this particular problem. So we only need that x and x. So now let's do these equations. Let's assume also uniform properties. And by using uniform properties, it becomes much simpler. So if we do that, we are gonna use, uh, first we do our continuity equation in there. So whatever out minus in. So let's just plug in the values. What happens, whatever comes out in here, we have our rho, it's rho plus the rho. Our velocity that comes out, it's gonna be A minus CB. And our area is just an area out. Now the area is gonna be the same in and out, so that's gonna cancel out. And whatever comes in is just the coverage by itself, so it's equal zero. So that area goes away. Now we just distribute in here. So let's just do that. Row A minus row B plus A to row minus C B to row minus row A equals zero. So we have this in here. Now this D B D T is second order, so it's much smaller than everything else in here, so it's barely black. This is very small. And that is because it's second order compared to everything else in the equation. So if we do that, this has a path attached, and we have our first equation in here, A, B, rho, minus rho, B, equals zero. So this is 
our first equation, and this is basically the conservation of mass for this parameter. Now let's do momentum. So let's start from basic. Uh, let's write the whole equation in here and what we need to do. Now remember, it's summation of forces in the air. So let's write that out. That is our changes in pressure plus body forces plus a viscous. And this is equal to our steady turn plus whatever crosses the control volume. Now, the body of forces, there's no anything acting on it. On the x direction, no viscous, viscous is there. Now, from here, by definition, this is the mass flow rate. Whatever comes in is pulled out. So we can just say that the mass flow rate is rho phase x. So you can simplify what we're doing. So let's do this. Now, what is important here to pay attention is that sine and negative do not get confused. And remember, our negative this time is going to be on the right hand side and not the left hand side. So here's where this can get a little bit confusing, it's just really the sign notation. So if we were to have our, our wave, our control volume, we have pressure acting and our dA comes out. And we have <laughs> pressure, so this is our T, this is our T plus T, and we have our area to see. Remember, our area is always pointing out of the control surface. So in this case, our x is to the left, so this is positive and this is negative. So in order to do that, we're going to get a negative. We cannot forget the negative, this one. So we keep that there. And we do uh, negative t a for the whatever comes in or on the right hand side. Plus, this is positive, so t t a. That would be our pressure return. So that's the only term that we have on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we're going to talk about our mass flow rate. So the same way, we have our wave. Remember the x is to the left hand side. So we have our a going this way, our da going that way. So that's negative. And our a minus db this way, and our da this way. So this is positive, as we know, always are positive, inwards are negative. So no matter what the notation is, that stays the same. So A minus D A rho phase A plus A negative rho phase A. So that's how we have the equation. We just uh, simplify this and we arrange terms and we get T A minus T plus D A equals A minus D B. We simplify even further. TA minus TA minus A T. A rho A A equals rho A A T T. Which one is rho A A? So we did that. This is the way, this is the way. And we just get our equation. So all that just to get DT rho A. So that's from conservation of mass, and that's from conservation of momentum. Now, from continuity, we have that equation in there. Now we can uh, solve the equation one for dB, and we plug that into two. So dB equals a d over rho. We plug this back into two, and if we solve that, we get that dT equals a squared. So this is the equation we have so far. Now remember, what we're looking for is what a is. And that is the speed of sound, so what we're looking for. So a squared equals dt d rho. And as we see from this equation, it really doesn't matter what the geometry is. We don't have any volume or areas in here, only the pressure and the density. So this is a very important conclusion because a does not depend on geometry. So a does not and on volume, on volume really on geometric parameters, or the velocity itself, or dB, which is the velocity of this thing. So basically, it doesn't matter how fast or slow we're going, it's 
speed of sound is always going to be constant. So basically from here we, we have that A, the speed of sound is a function <coughs> and then which is just basically saying that it is only a function of thermal, a thermal, thermal property. And this is why no matter what geometry we have, our, our, our velocity of sound is always stays the same. So because of that, being that it's thermal property, we have to rewrite dt integral as a partial. Because we also have, when we talk about thermal property, we have to worry about temperature and entropy. So those are also functions of the yeah. speed of sound is going to change also in how that works. Any questions? So the next question that we ask ourselves is that our sound wave isentropic. <coughs> so is it isentropic? And if that is, it's going to simplify everything. And by doing that, we can use the isentropic equation to solve our problem. So first of all, in this case, or this kind of controlling that we did, we say we're using compression case. So sound wave is a weak compression wave. So why say that it's weak? This is basically because any changes that we have when we're doing it and it's going to be small. So we have changes in fluid are very small. So that's the move. So because of that, we can then consider this reversible. Of course, this is ideal in a real case. We can never really go back. But being that this change is so small in technicality, we can just go back and forth. The sound wave is very, very thin. So the next thing we can say is extremely, so extremely thin. So because of that, we have that changes are too fast. For speed transfer, so there is enough time for the temperature to change. So are too fast for speed transfer. So in a sound wave, we're going to have this anxiety. Now, something to keep in mind about using a sound wave: a sound wave is not is not a shock wave. So this is not a shock wave. So don't get them confused. Later on, we're going to talk about shock waves. Sound waves we have them everywhere, and they're traveling at a speed of sound, but we're normally going to travel slower than that, so we're not colliding. So because of that, this isentropic, uh, we can just rewrite this rewrite the equation for A in terms of just mentioning that. So A is where the partial of T rho at a constant S. So basically, we're just saying that it's isentropic. Now remember, we're talking here about compression. So what about uh, expansion? Expansion is going to be the exact same thing. We could do the derivation. It's going to work the same way. It's just going to be a little bit different. So I can just, just going to set up the problem here. And if you just want to work at it at home to make the, uh, the derivation, it's exactly the same. We first have a moving wave. We have rest. We have a piston. In this case, the piston is going to be moving to the left. So this is expansion. So we're going to have the P minus T, rho minus rho, and this time we're going to have the dv to the So everything is moving, but this time the opposite. We can make the same controlling, change this from a moving to a stationary uh, problem. And if we do the same controlling analysis, we're going to get exactly the same answer. So T, K rho, S. Just meaning that for both compression and expansion, the speed of sound is going to be the same. So that doesn't matter either. Now, we already said this isentropic problems, so we really, it's not that easy to solve this mathematically. So in order to do that, let's simplify that even further. So we know that isentropic flow, well, there's a relationship between pressure and density. That is P2, or P1, equals rho2 from rho1 over gamma. We derive this at the end of chapter one, so this is just an isentropic flow I made. Now we're gonna rewrite this, so you can rewrite this as the pressure, so if we do that and we do the math, so we get that rho rho s equals zero. So here to go from here to here, it just we're just doing like differentiation, very simple. And you can do that yourself if you have any questions, let me know about that. 
Then we get this, we can just um, remember this is, we know what this is, the definition of A, so we rearrange that. We get that A for the speed of sound is going to be gamma T of rho, or something that we're more familiar with, and we substitute here the gas equation, is it A equals gamma R. And basically all that was to get to this equation. Where if you remember, gamma is the um, ratio of sensitivity to CP over CV. And for um, air, gamma will be 1.3. Any questions? So this is, remember, what's very important to keep in mind, this is for perfect gases. So this is not gonna hold true for a uh, liquid or for a uh, solid. This is just for perfect gases, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on and so forth. So what happens if we don't have a perfect gas? So not a perfect gas, what would be the case? So first of all, for a perfect gas, like we were saying, <coughs> we have gamma, we have the gas constant, and we have the absolute temperature. And we see that directly from the equation in here. Now, also, we can say here, it says speed of sound, because of this equation, is larger in lighter, lighter gases. Like, so, speed of light is going to be much larger when we say lighter and lighter for the light density. Okay. So that's just directly from here. Basically, we're going to be treating in this class, but just always to keep in mind, it's good to know, is when we have not a perfect gas. And here comes the concept of compressibility. <coughs> and this is just that concept. It's how compressible can we get? So gases are very compressible, so we tend to do this. But what about solids? We cannot really compress them that much. So this is compressibility, it's gonna be a measure of relative <coughs> volume change with pressure. So it depends how much pressure we put, how much we can compress or expand whatever we have in front of us. Now when it comes to solids and liquids, they're much less compressible than a gas would be. Now, for this, we have to introduce compressibility constants. So when we're talking about isentropic flow or isothermal flow, we have Kf and Kt. So this is just compressibility constant that you might find in textbooks. Sometimes you find this as beta or as K. They're just constants. And this is just the S and the T. It's just to say that we're talking about either an isentropic process or an isothermal. So here we have S equals constant and T equals constant. And there's like how you can go and find a book and have all these different uh, parameters of constants for different uh, different uh, substances. So in terms of, uh, we're not gonna do any derivations, it's just gonna go what the <coughs> actual definition is and how we were to write that. So how are we to write the uh, speed of sound in terms of this parameter? So if we have uh, isentropic flow, our A in terms of this parameter is going to be 1 over rho Kf. So we have the density of the substance we're dealing with, and we can find that compressibility constant for isentropic flow. We can use this equation. But if we have the compressibility constant in terms of uh, isothermal, we can write it this way. So we just have an extra gamma in there. I have to consider in which this Kt over Kf equals gamma. So if you have the gamma of the solid or the substance and you have the other parameter, you can find the other one. And that would be the speed of sound within, let's say, liquids and things. So if you go in the back of the book, you're actually going to find some of these parameters in there. So we can look at table 2.1. This will be for gases. And basically, these tables we have some of the compressibility constants and the gamma. And 2.2 will be liquids, and 2.3 will be solids. Now, depending on the version of the book that you have, there's actually a typo in one of these tables, and that has to do with the units. Uh, the 
it comes for the bulk module. So this is for liquid cell And when we're talking about cell lists, we just change the number of this. So cell lists, we introduce the bulk module. And this is beta x. That's why you might see this not really as beta x, but as kappa or k for compressibility, because they get a little bit confused with the cell lists. Compressibility parameter. So this parameter in these tables you can find them. Uh, it has in the book it has units of kilopascals. It is <coughs> actually gigapascals, which is ten to the negative third. So make sure that that is um, fixed. If you need to use the parameters, because the table has more about it. Anyway. So for solids, this bulk modulus equal to rho dt d rho x. And basically what's important in here is just that we have what the free up term is. And that is rho x squared of x. And that would be the speed of sound in a solid. And this bulk parameter is just really the inverse of the isentropic compressibility parameter. So that's why sometimes in some textbooks or wherever you might be reading, <coughs> it might be interchangeable. So it's important to look into the units to make sure that you have the right value of it. Like I said, in this class, we're not really going to do much with them. It's just for you to have a reference. On Thursday, I'm actually going to do a problem so you see how this would work. And just to see how the difference is between the speed of light and different in a gas, in a liquid, and a solid, and see how that changes. Any questions? Okay, so that's it. And I'll see you on Thursday.